Good day everyone, this is John with Tommy's Top Picks. Today we're going to be talking about uh, tech, tech within the game. I've uh, alluded to this in a few other videos and have come up with a few interesting tidbits of information, the math of the game and how it all works together in order to basically help you evaluate what is valuable and what is good and what is useful. And in some ways this will help with the market side of things because you'll be able to identify high value cards almost immediately, which means you'll be able to speculate on them before they get a lot of play and then the market realizes in general or the players realize in general that they're high value. Uh, obviously any sort of speculation regarding this is not financial advice and should take into account things like printing numbers because just because something is valuable from a gameplay mechanic standpoint as we'll talk about in a second it doesn't necessarily mean that it will gain a high value it's just the ones that um, age essentially have gotten a high value and it's uh, it's proven out pretty well uh, from historic sets so let's just take a look at it and see if it makes sense uh, if you like this content, go ahead and leave a comment below, uh, like and subscribe. I do look at the analytics for all of this, and if it makes sense to keep doing these, um, as long as I'm able to find more tech and interesting mechanics to examine and dig into, and I have a couple projects in mind, so I think I can for a little while at least, uh, I'll keep doing it. And uh, hopefully it's useful for your gaming and competitiveness, and I'm myself getting into some of the local competitions, so part of the reason and motivation for doing this work is to get a little bit of an edge in those competitions. So far it's worked out well. I won my last armory, hands down, 3-0, um, and using this tech and this kind of information to build my deck so uh, it's, it's useful across the board in all formats. It's more useful, I think, in Constructed because you get a choice of which cards you pick. But it's also useful in evaluating cards that you've drawn in a, a sealed format or even in a um, drafting format. You'll be able to quickly do some math and determine which cards have approximately the most value within a pack. And then, of course, you have to build around themes and things like that. So it does get a little bit more complex than that. But this is a good baseline bit of information. So without further ado, let's go ahead and jump into our first ever tech report on the card value fundamentals. All right. So the first thing to discuss is the card point system. This is pretty clear. If you look at any card, you can determine an overall value. It's based on eight points for attack and seven points for non-attack. And what I mean by that is if you look at the pitch value plus the attack value plus the defense value and subtract the cost out, it will equal eight points. And this is true and easiest to see in cards like Weave Lightning, uh, I'm sorry, um, Heaven's Claw, which essentially has no card text because it's, it's a straight piece of math using that formula I just described. Um, it will be modified by the card effects. So if there's like a on hit draw or a pitch or creative room chance, something like that, that adds value or subtracts value um, from the total points. And so you can kind of determine what different mechanics values are using this formula and realizing that it should equal eight. And it's really easy, and we'll see it in a second, to see this system at work with the different colors because you know red, yellow, and blue all have different pitch values, and so everything gets kind of tweaked and modified as you use this formula. So it allows you to really see the value of each mechanic as LSS envisions it. And I'm not sure they use this system. This isn't some sort of internal knowledge, but it's kind of obvious if you analyze the cards and look at a lot of different cards, you can see how this all fits together. And there are some exceptions, and we'll talk about those a little bit later. For attack cards, it's seven points using pitch plus defense plus or minus the card effect value should equal around seven. Um, so some basic card effects and their values, obviously a plus one attack equals plus one point. Draw a card, plus one point. Go again is typically plus one point. There might be some exceptions. This is one where I'm not quite sure and I need some deeper analysis. It, it, may, be, it may be that it's only in some cases they count it as go again, where the card would be used by itself and not necessarily have go again. I'm not sure on that part. Uh, Fuse is a reveal card, which there's a couple different ways to reveal cards. Those typically give a minus one point. And discard or bottom a card is also a minus one point. And that's, uh, both of those are per card revealed, per card bottomed, or discarded. So um, that's just kind of a basic, and you'll see how these go into work here in a second. All right, so Heaven's Claw, like I was talking about, is a perfect example. So 
if you take this value of three for the pitch, three for the defense, and three for the attack, you total nine. But then you subtract the cost and you're eight. So this is an eight card value, or eight value card. Same with this, three, five, I'm sorry, three, five, and one is a total of what? Nine, exactly, minus one, again, equals eight. Same thing for the yellow. So you can see that this is a very basic example. There's no text on this one, so you're not getting any complexities with this that are kind of harder to read through. But this is a very simple example of how the card attack value cards uh, all equal eight points in total. So meet and greet, this one's a little more complex. You have an attack of two, a defense of three, so five, plus three for a pitch value on the blue is eight, and then you subtract the one, you're at seven. So where's that additional point come from? Well, if it hits, create a room chant. So now we know room chant tokens are plus one in value. So that gets it back up to eight. If you have dealt arcane damage to an opposing hero this turn, meet and greet gains go again. So this is one of those ones where go again, I'm not sure, right? Does this mean this is a zero value? I could see it being two pieces. If you have dealt or deal arcane damage being a minus one point because the if is hard to achieve in most games. And you guys think about it in terms of uh, card trade off and games like that, it's not easy to get that one arcane damage. So that's probably a minus one requirement. Go again being a plus one requirement would neutralize the two and then you'd have an eight point value for meet and greet. Again, same applies for the red and the yellow. They just tweak the values of the attack value and the pitch value or what trade. Everything else stays the same. But you'll notice on some cards where it'll say like a plus one attack value, plus two attack value, and plus three depending on the color. So sometimes it trades with the text in the card. Sometimes it just trades with the attack value. Um, other times it's it's defense. Well, actually, I don't think defense modifies much. I think it's mostly these two items, the attack value and then the in-text changes. Buzzball, final example on the attack value points. Three, 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 nine minus one equals eight. But look at this, it has text that does things. Lightning fusion, reveal card. If it's a lightning card, then you can get this additional value. So this seems like it's a minus one. And then if it was uh, fused, then whenever attack hits this turn, deals one damage. So that's a one damage plus one modifier. Now this one's an interesting one. It may be higher value in general, if you think about it. If you're high in lightning fusion, this one damage carries to multiple attacks in a turn. So if you're high in damage and have lots of go again, this generates an additional bit of value for you for this particular card because it's it's one that gets it to that eight value, you know, these two neutralized. But if this hits one, two, three times in a turn, now you've overvalued. You've, you've made more value than a typical card would. And that's what you're trying to go for when you're building decks. You want cards and combinations that create a higher overall value using a point system so that uh, versus your opponent so that you will eventually outweigh them. And I, I do believe this is um, something that can be analyzed on a broader scale, looking at all the matches, all the winners, and using a point system. You can probably see a correlation between the advantageous card value generation that I'm describing here and those who end up going on to win, at least over uh, a long course of time. So jumping into the non-attacks, now this one I'm a little less clear on and I want to do some deeper analysis on it. I might do a follow-up video on this as I dig in deeper, but as of right now, my theory is it's a seven-point card and there's definitely some variability on this and it's a little harder to nail down than the attack because you're working with a little more abstracts. Obviously, non-attack actions tend to be uh, more game effect, more text, more different impacts on the game and, and if statements, if you will. So it's harder to judge. And maybe that's just why there's variance because someone in LSS is making rules using a generalized system and it's not really obvious when every single impact may impact lots of games versus few games, what works best, what doesn't. I'm sure there's some design basis around this. I just don't fully know it. So, you know, kind of trying to 
hack into the black box of how they create their rule system. It's a little bit uncertain exactly how this works, but you know, we can go through it. It gives good examples. And again, it works very well when you're trying to draft or do a sealed event in determining kind of what value you want to grab and which cards to maximize your, your deck build. And obviously for constructed too, it's easiest to use in constructed. So let's go through it. So snapback, it is a wizard action. So it's a, it's a non-attack action. It or it pitches for three, it costs one, and it defends for three. So this is six minus one is five. Now deal one damage automatically, so we already know a plus one damage is a plus one, so that gets it to six. And then if you've played another wizard non-attack action card this turn, and if you know anything about wizard, most of their cards are non-attack actions. In fact, I'm not sure if wizard has any attack actions. I think they're all non-attack. So this is a high probability true, right? You may play a snapback as though it were an instant. So gaining instant is a plus one point is what it sounds like, right? Because we have three, six, minus one is five, plus one is six, and then this instant value is a, a plus one because it's going to happen almost every time this non-attack is is very, very likely to be true. So this is a plus one in my opinion. Again, it's a little vaguer to work it all out, but that's, that's kind of how it works. And here's an example of where the text changes, the, the, the uh, damage dealt changes based on the value. So you have three and one and three, so that's seven minus one is six, and then the instant thing gets it back up to seven. So that's, that's an example of how those might work. Uh, Sutcliffe's research notes. This one's a little more complex and that's why I put it in here because I want to really kind of look through it, examine it, think about it a little bit. And if any of you come up with a smarter way of envisioning this, leave a comment or if you see something that I'm missing, you know, by all means, reach out. I'd love to dig into this more. I think it's awesome and fun to learn about how this all works together and how these systems play. And, and obviously LSS reserves a right to change the meta, you know, pump value and, and power going future. Uh, looking into the future and, and, you know, react to what's happening in the game if things get out of control. We'll talk a little bit about that towards the end because there's there's some stuff out of control as we just saw in the U.S. Nationals. Um, and I think I've identified how to get that maximum value that these, um, you know, pro-level players are, are playing with. So we'll talk about that in a second, though. So pitch for three, uh, add two for the defense value. So now we're at five. Minus one, we're at four. So we're at four, and we need to get to seven theoretically, so there should be three points of value in here. So, reveal the top card of your deck. That's probably a plus one, just because you get to see what's coming. It's like an opt one that we think is probably a plus one if you look at all the other cards, right? Create a room chant token, plus one for that, because that's one damage in the future, right? So now we're at, uh, what is this, five, six, seven, minus one is six, and then go again plus one this is where i'm i say this is a this is one where it is a plus one is it always it, it's kind of hard to tell but i think it is so let's look at the red right so we got one and two is three in total minus one is two so then we get a plus three cards right so three plus two we're back at five and then create a rune chant six and then go again seven so I think this is how it balances out. I'm pretty sure that's kind of the internal balancing system. Uh, but when you look at cards in comparison, that's where it gets a little less clear. But you, you get the idea, and this kind of helps uh, illustrate that. Uh, Alpha Blood is a great kind of easy example, right? So it's 3, and 3 is 6, minus 1 is 5, plus 1 to the next attack. Or, sorry, this is an attack reaction, which is interesting to look at. It, it works a lot like the non-attack or non-attack actions. So I think that's kind of the key here. I think it's attack and non-attack. There may be subcategories that allow for cheaper point values or such. I haven't identified them yet, but this is kind of where I'm at right now. So anyways, so 6 minus 1, or at 5, plus 1 is 6. And then the reprise would be a plus 1 if uh, because you can you can make sure this happens with this card. It's it's an attack reaction. You know how they defend it. So you get this plus 1, uh, and that allows you to get to that, that point value of 7. So same thing with red. You can see how it adjusts with this plus 3 here and this plus 2 here. Now, this is an important one and very interesting. So, plunder run. Um, just go through the math real quick. It costs zero. It takes three. Uh, it's a pitch value of three and a two defense, so we're at five, right? Next time you attack, draw a card. So that 
is a plus one, that's six. And then if it's played from the arsenal, the next attack action card you play this turn gets a plus one. I think they're saying this is neutral because playing from the arsenal isn't a guarantee and isn't the easiest thing to pull off, right? So I think that's a negative one and this is a plus one. They balance each other out. So we're still down one point and then go again gives you that last point you need. Now it's, it's interesting to see that card draw is a plus one and we'll talk a little bit about that in a second. Before we jump into that, we can see the rest of how this one plays out. So in the red, it's it's interesting. This is where you get some of that, I'm not sure exactly how they play these. So in the red, it's interesting. You have a one pitch value, a two defense, so we're at three. There's no cost, so it's just three. Plus one for draw card, right? So that's four. But then this is a minus one, we think, that if from Arsenal is a minus one, so now we're down to three. But only on that conditional do we get our plus three back. So that's an interesting, you know, it, it makes the math curious. It makes you wonder exactly how these systems play. Uh, but it's essentially going to get you to six and then seven. You still get there, but it's on this contingent, which I guess is just a minus one. It's not, it doesn't cancel the three, even though they're related numerics, right? You don't get this plus three if this minus one doesn't happen. So they see this as balanced. I'm not sure that I would agree, and there's some other reasons for that going forward, but it's an interesting thing to, to dig into the thinking of the, the rule makers and, and kind of the balance system. And obviously the yellow does the same, but a plus two. I think this if is not a set value of minus one, or I think it, it shouldn't necessarily be, which means any of the situations, any of the cards such as Plunder Run that does use it as only a minus one, you can gain additional value by playing this red right like that's what that's what can happen with that um because it should be a minus two or minus three or whatever right and instead it's just a minus one and how do you balance everything else out it's worth thinking about and there you'll start to see these anomalies we'll talk about this in a second but essentially there's anomalies in the system in the games in the decks these these cards like e-strike um and art of war and such that essentially are big value cards overvalued cards for the system and so they're a little bit overbalanced and again if you kind of calculate the points of trade turns and how it all plays out you'll see that this is the uh, a core value dynamic that is important to keep an eye on and allows you to essentially determine who will win or even more you know how to build a deck so that it is stronger than an average card deck and this is again why you see different players migrating to the same sets of cards because they do have additional value and they realize that they might not understand the math around it all or, or even realize why they just see that they're successful when you play this card and so it's valuable right and all of this is theory of course so like i said i don't have any inside track all right so plunder run as we spoke zero is extra value why and this is important. Zero means you don't pitch. Now think about a turn. You have four cards in your hand, you swing with a card, and then you pay for a card. So you lose a card from your hand, you now only have two cards in your hand. So most turns you need to use two cards to do anything. Well, not with zero. Zero, you just swing with a card. You don't need to use another card. And so it's almost the same a zero cost card is almost the same as having a draw effect because at the end of the day, you get that additional card in your hand, which allows you to continue on, have a resource for this, that, or the other, right? So that's an additional point of value. And we already know draw card is a plus one. There's a couple of examples that essentially it's a attack with a draw and it, it very clearly is a plus one. And what that means is that if a if draw is a plus one, then zero should be an additional plus one of value because you're not pitching, you're not losing a card. So any card with zero is a little overvalued because they didn't give it a plus one in this system. Um, as you can see with this Arcanic Crackle, right? So it's a three, a three, so six, seven, minus zero, plus one is eight. So it totals eight. But it doesn't take into the account that you're not pitching a card. So you're going to have an extra card in your hand because it costs zero. So without giving it the same kind of balance as if draw a card was on here, you get a little bit more value from an Arcanic Crackle than you do from most cards that have a pitch value. And it's just automatic. And the same goes with the non-attack actions. 
um, essentially, you know, this, you do the math on this and it's a zero. So it's almost like drawing two cards because you draw a card from this attack, but then you also didn't pitch anything. So you have that additional card, which is one of the reasons you see Plunder Run used in almost every competitive deck. It is so, so good, especially being generic action, right? It can be used across classes. Um, compare that to Brandish, right? Which again, you don't have. So let's just play it out in our minds, right? So three, two, right? That's five, six, and then seven, and then eight for go again, but minus one for the cost, right? So that the eight value is there, you put that down, but then you lose a card because you have to pay for that one. And well, you could use equipment or something like that, but those are very limited, right? Typically you're gonna be using a card from hand, which means you're now down a card in hand versus one of these turns where you just played two cards and you still have two cards left. Do you see, you see what I'm saying? It makes a big difference. You played this turn and you have no cards left in a four hand, right? Because these each cost one, so you had to get rid of a card. These cost zero, you didn't have to get rid of any cards. So you have a lot more power, a lot more strength and a lot more value in zero cost cards. And that's just one of those things that I don't think it was designed specifically around. Maybe it wasn't thought about. I, I don't think that's true because LSS is pretty smart and they have a good system. Um, but it's one of those things that's piece of the meta. And we'll talk a little bit more about how you can play this in different classes, but at the end of the day, it's why you're seeing what you're seeing in the meta. So speaking of the meta, here's some cards that probably look familiar. Um, Enlightened Strike, Scar for Scar, Exude Confidence, and then Ravenous Rabble, Snatch, and Coax a Commotion. This one's a newcomer. It just hit in the UK Nationals, but I bet you'll start seeing it all over the place. Uh, and why? Because it all does the same thing. There's zero cost cards. And again, it doesn't have to be red. Uh, originally, and I've been talking about this on a couple discords and various places, I said this red liner concept is broken because of this additional value thing. But I didn't even think about it. There's lots of other cards that are zero value. Now you'll see there's a reason to keep it in the red, generally speaking. One, because it's a higher attack value, but you know, sometimes it trades for different things, so it can be worth it to have the yellow. Um, but also because certain cards have advantage for you having all red. Um, they tried to balance it in the meta, generally speaking, against the red versus blue and pitching and wanting to have resource cards. That was the mentality, and it, it doesn't work out when you realize that there's an extra bit of value in red and you just go all red. Um, so let's just walk through them real quick. So you got, you know, eight, nine, minus zero. Now this says you bottom a card, so then that would be minus a one. So now you're back at eight, and then you get this additional value of draw a card, uh, et cetera, plus two or go again. So this doesn't even balance out on the basics and you add the zero. This is why this card is used in like every deck. It is super valuable. And there's a handful of other ones that are that with that. Uh, CNC is another one. It's just overvalued. Like if you do the same math on it, it's worth more. And so there's certain, there's certain cards that are worth more. And this is one of those things like, if you're doing a draft or whatever, you can literally look at the cards in front of you, do this quick math and say, okay, this is a more valuable card in general. So digging around this or working around this is better. Also, the opposite is true. There's a few cards that are under value. Um, they just don't add up to, to seven or eight, you know, depending on attack or, or non-attack. And you know right off the bat, this is not a good card to have in your deck because it's just underpowered versus other things. Now there's areas where it gets gray, right? Where you have these neutral things that can then be extended, such as that fuse and the plus one. It's treated as a plus one, but if you know you're going to be doing multiple attacks in a turn because you have multiple go agains or things of that nature, that can add up and then increase the value of a card that may be undervalued. And I think a lot of the ones that are designed undervalued are designed around that sort of concept. Exude Confidence is a complex one, right? Six, seven, right? So it's at seven. This is probably a plus one getting it to an eight. And then this is a neutral because you have to pay for it. So it's at an eight. But if you think about it, it's a zero cost. That adds that one value of draw card essentially. And so it's a little overvalued because of that. At the end of the day, anything that's zero cost attack for, you're overvalued because you're essentially getting that draw card and you're at a break point. So when you consider the break points as part of this, um, for those not familiar, break point is uh, over a defense. Most cards defend for three, so if you're attacking for four, you're over the break point. That means they're going to have to defend with two, especially if there's an on-hit effect. They're going to have to defend with two cards to prevent that on-hit effect. And when they do that, it's you're taking card advantage right at that point. You're essentially using, especially with a zero cost, you're using one card to take away two cards from them. And that's huge value gain for your side and your attack. 
Um, so breakpoints are really important, and this is why you see a lot of these red line decks with anything that's a four attack and zero cost, they have it in the deck. And you see, here's the same, here's the same. This averages to be four if you're in a red line deck. And this is what I was talking about before, why there's an advantage to some decks to not use these yellows. Yellows can be good and ultimately add up to be of higher value because of the draw card, quote unquote, effect of zero. But uh, when you look at cards like this that subtract based on the pitch value, it's sad. If you have Ravenous Rabble and you flip a Scar for Scar 2, uh, yellow rather, um, you're sad because you just made this a 3 attack instead of a 4 attack. And as we said, 0 4s are past that breakpoint, have even a little bit more value. So you can think about attack values and breakpoints as almost an additional plus 1 that you're looking for. Now another side of the uh, breakpoint thing is anything that combos up to 7, obviously is another breakpoint. And then um, once you get to 11, if you're dealing with some of the big swingers, which there, there are out there, that's a, that's a third break point. Um, like Bravo does a lot of high level and you can, you can add up, rank up. And I think that's one of the reasons Bravo does so well is because he forces uh, big break point situations that's like, wow, I have to drop my entire hand just to not get the on-hit effect. And that's, that's a very difficult decision to make, and it makes the games very difficult for people. Um, oh, here's the example. Snatch is the, the classic do the math and get that draw card is one, right? So six, seven, uh, eight, draw a card, right? Because there's no subtraction for one. And then essentially, because of what we've discovered here with the zero cost, it's an additional draw card because you didn't use a card. You didn't pitch anything. So you're essentially getting a nine value out of this card. So this is a very basic example of how you do it. Now, Coax of Commotion. This one's interesting. And I want you to really think about it. Everyone's like, this is a silly one because it helps your opponent, right? And in other games, you really do uh, not want to help your opponent. You want to do whatever you can to not help your opponent. So cards that help your opponent typically are bad. Not so in a game that trades back and forth on value. And I'll explain why. So... Again, you get the zero cost, so you're essentially free draw, right? You got one and four, it's five, six, seven, and then you'd figure this is at least one, but it can be two or three, right? So now you're at an eight, nine, or ten value card for yourself. Now, the balance is that your opponent gets it as well. Well, guess what? A quicken token allows you to go again, and a draw card is an additional card. And when you're drawing all extra value cards, they can go ahead and draw a three defense card because you're going to be coming at them with a break point card that costs you nothing. You see what I'm saying? So they're going to have an extra card, but you're going to have an extra card that you know will have a stronger value than they will just right off the bat. And then, of course, then you go again is absolutely imperative for zero card decks because every go again, you can just put another card down. It costs you nothing. The pitch isn't a limitation anymore. So that's kind of how that works. Uh, we already talked about Plunder Run. You get the idea on that. Nimbalism is one of the non-attacks. Sorry, that's how it's broken down. These are the attacks and non-attacks. Uh, nimbalism is a non-attack that essentially talks about the same sort of concept. Again, you got one and two is three plus three. And it helps with red because anything costs one or less, right? So you're, you're at that point where red is, again, just more advantageous. So you got six, and then the go again gives you seven. So that's generally how that one works. Uh, pretty interesting stuff. You start to see the insights. You start to see why these cards show up in every freaking deck. And, of course, anything that follows these rules and gives you this advantage that's a generic powerhouse, powerhouse that can be used in every deck well worth keeping an eye on and there's a reason these cards have higher market value than other cards so let's talk about the different classes um ninja has a bunch of these zero cost cards that basically have a little bit extra value notice you see ninja a lot in the meta light warrior is one that surprised me when i dug into the data uh it has a bunch too uh bolt of courage engulfing light it's not as prominent but if you throw in those generics you're, you're pretty much there you can get it done in in light warrior i haven't dug into the deck lists my like in depth but i think there's a way to do kind of a, a cheerio or zero cost sort of deck around light warrior that would work out well i need to dig into uh the class effects and how the soul thing works um, and some of the other details about the instances and what they do, kind of ratios of attacks that are available versus non-attacks and how that works out. Uh, because I know there's a lot of weapon attacking with the Light Warrior right now with Bolton. And so that might be a detriment because that costs and then you're pitching and, you know, that now breaks the whole concept. I haven't dug in too deep, but I think there's a place there for it to be considered. Ranger, I think, is absolutely poised to take advantage of this. Obviously, 
think Ninja already takes advantage of this. I think Ranger's ready to. Um, there are a ton of cards here. Dazzling Crescendos in the latest set. Remorseless is a classic one. Bolton Shot. There's there's a bunch of zero cost, basically. Red Line Tech uh, in the Ranger setup that could be useful for this kind of concept. Now, the downside is that the bows typically cost to load, but then you're playing from Arsenal for free. So if you can get the right balance there, and I'm not sure if that means bringing in two pitches or looking at different ways of approaching that, or if you go with the... Um, I think it's called Redliner, right? The bow that costs zero to load. Uh, if that's the case, it's kind of like they're kind of like pointing this out within the meta of the game and the, the language of the game. Because I'm pretty sure it's called Redliner, the bow, and it costs zero to load. And so zero load with zero attackers, like, come on, that's a win right there. And if you can balance your defenses against uh, high swingers and things like that, you, you got some power there. Or you can build something that counters, you know, meta that's like this. Because I think this is going to be everywhere. Obviously, there's multiple classes, but it's also just more advantageous mathematically for anything that does it. The more you do this, the more value you're bringing in your deck and therefore your better chance of winning. So if everyone's gonna kind of go this route, this red route, um, as heavily as is possible and makes sense with all the other factors to consider, then your your good balance is gonna be something like maybe an ice ranger that uh, does um, frostbite tokens because that adds a cost and therefore there's forces pitching, which again breaks this concept. So something to think about as the meta progresses going forward, and I think this is why Lexi ended up in the top eight at the US Nationals, um, because there's definitely some value there and ability to do some of this stuff. Wizards, uh, they're weird. <laughs> I love them. I think there are a lot of interesting concepts here, and I want to dig into them deeper, but they have a very limited uh, card pool right now, and they don't attack. They use actions only. So without that attack, it's, it's a little odd. They do have quite a few of these zero-cost ones, but I think there's enough disadvantages built into the way Wizards work that it, it balances out ultimately. I, I haven't dug enough into this one. I, I do want to revisit that. And then obviously the queen of the entire party is the rune blade right the rune blade has so many ways of doing this not only with the generics but with all their class stuff but and this is why you're seeing them as the top of the meta right now and probably will for some time until a good counter comes out which i think we'll have to wait until the next set before we see it um i could be wrong on that but that's my suspicion uh the biggest thing is their class advantage they have an advantage by playing an attack and a non-attack. That's the entire theme around Rune Blades. So any one of the three Rune Blades gets an advantage for doing that. So they are doubly incentivized to get that extra value of zero attack cards because not only do they get to keep cards in hand and not pitch anything, but they get the advantage of whatever happens when they trigger that attack and non-attack, be it go again and things like that for... Um, uh, sorry, what's her name? Briar uh, and the uh, the embodiments of Earth for uh, Briar as well. If you do the the two, or if you hit rather, and then um, what is it? The Rune Chant tokens with Vasari, and it's just it is the extra value for doing the thing that Redline does best and is already overvalued as we compare to other structures that use pitching. Um, so that's kind of how that all works and, and why you're seeing Runeblade at the top of the meta. I also understand that James White likes Runeblade. It was like part of his original vision. Um, so he, he has a, a, you know, a warm place in his heart for Runeblade. So there's probably a little bit more advantage there just out of, out of love for the class and concept. Um, but right now it's, it's definitely heavy in the meta. They'll pro they will do something to correct it. Cause it can't just be like Runeblades only. Everyone would get upset about that. And not having a balance to it is is a factor. But I think recognizing that zero is basically a draw card is a big step to realizing how to counteract this. And there are ways. There are ways. In fact, we're going to talk about those. So countertech. Frostbite token. Uh, obviously, it costs one to do that next action. I think if this was a little bit different or if they come up with a new version of Frostbite that's... Uh, extra one for everything in the turn or something of that nature would be a big uh, shutdown in, in this sort of tech and way it works. There's something to extend Frostbite. Maybe 
there's a added effect that you can throw out by um, that says the frostbite token. Once it dies, it generates another one 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 time or something. You know, something like that where it can last more than once. But essentially, anything that forces a cost onto zero pitch, it shuts this down pretty easily. And we did see that in. I think it was the calling Orlando. The last fight was um, Oldheim versus one of these somewhat red line. They did use blue cards, but um, somewhat red line Briar deck. And when you look at that, he ended up winning. And I think Frostbite Tokens is a huge way to do that. Tripwire Trap is another one that adds a one value. Um, Spinal Crush is one that gets rid of go again. So those combos don't work anymore. Imagine if all you're doing is the one swing. That's very detrimental for this kind of deck. And then um, the other one that I thought of after creating the uh, presentation here was the prism effects, right? The uh, Arclight Sentinel forces you to fight the Arclight Sentinel so you can't swing against anything else. And then it also shuts down the combat chain. So the Spectra is if you attack the Spectra and it's kind of dangerous to ignore them. So you kind of want to attack them. Um, the downside to that one is there's some optionality to how you do it. Um, you can actually swing with your weapon to attack them so you don't lose any cards except for the pitch value. And it's it's a little bit not that great of a counter um, compared to things that shut you down um, on the opposite side. So those are, those are some ways to actually counter this. And I fully expect the meta to adapt. I think a lot of people are looking at this deeply now, including myself, and we'll, we'll adjust. So are there any others? Did I miss anything? Are there other pieces or concepts around this that you've identified or seen in your local armories or even competitively, however? Um, let me know. Uh, if you like this content, you know, definitely leave a comment about what you want to see with this going forward. There's lots of different ways to explore. One of the projects I want to do is uh, database every single card value and using this system to kind of math out every single factor and determine the highest value cards by that and actually play with it against uh, market values and see what that looks like and then various other things um, just to analyze a little bit deeper, get a deeper understanding of kind of the subtext and the math underneath the game itself. Um, I think this is really interesting. I love this stuff and I think it's playing out in the meta as we speak i actually i think i said this in one of my other videos i i actually realized this a while ago right before the uk nationals uh, I was digging into the data and I found this and I was like, oh, this is going to be consistently more advantageous. And then uh, UK Nationals came up with all the Briars playing, you know, basically red line. I was like, oh, no, everyone discovered it all at once. <laughs> Apparently it was going around before that, but I hadn't heard about it. So I was very pleased to, to discover this and uh, I want to I want to dig into it more. So anyways, uh, if you like the content, you know, leave a thumbs up, subscribe, uh, pass this on to other people. I, the more the community understands these things, the more the meta shifts and changes because you have more minds working on this problem and how to how to attack it and change it because it would be very boring if for the next you know few months until the next set comes out everyone's just playing briar red line right so let's let's figure out a way as a community to to actually expand and change the meta um, before the next major competitions and see you know see what's going on all right well that's it for now but uh if you like the content subscribe and let me know in the comments what else you'd like to hear about there's lots more to explore and i'm pretty excited to do it obviously all right have a good one